Hey everybody, welcome to Active Churches Online. My name is Joe, and you may know this guy. This is my good friend, Mike. Hey everybody. And we're so glad to welcome you to our very first online service. We are one church today, meeting in so many different locations. Thousands of locations. Thousands of locations right <laughs> Thousands now. Thousands of people. And you're probably watching this maybe on your couch, or maybe in your bed, or maybe you're in the comfort of your own home, or maybe you're listening to it later and you're driving, pay attention, don't, don't take your <laughs> eyes off the road. Uh, wherever you're watching this, we're just so grateful that you have decided to engage with us, active at home or active in your car, wherever you're at, yeah. we're honored to be with you. How about this? Actually, let us know where you're at right now. That's uh, a great idea. Unless you're driving, then don't let us know. Later, <laughs> let, do that later. Let us know by tagging your friends and also smashing that share button because we just wanna say thank you for joining us today online. Smash, like Hulk, smash that share yeah. button, I love that. And if you are new for the very first time, listen, I know that church online might be different for some, but for some of you, maybe you've been doing this for a while and we haven't met you yet. So there is a link in the description. Would you click that link and let us know that you are watching today? We are so excited that you're joining us, but we want to know your name. And one way we can also know your name and know the stories that are going on is by you taking photos and posting them and tagging us yeah. on Instagram and Facebook. That's a great idea. So take some photos of worship, take some photos of your friends, Friends, take some photos of you guys watching and tag us because we're preparing something for Easter mm. Sunday. We're gonna go really big and there's a special moment that I don't want you to miss out on. So go ahead and tag us at Active Churches, Instagram and Facebook. Absolutely, and in this season, as we're under quarantine, um, I, I really think that it's an opportunity for us to really practice extreme, radical, uncommon generosity. Right. And so I wanna invite you to start by giving to Active Church. We mm. believe that we need to connect our hearts to our our hands. It's something Pastor Joe says all the time. All the time. And I want to invite you to practice generosity and to help us to provide, provide hope in our cities. You can do it in two ways. One, go to activechurches.com, click the giving link, or you can text the amount that you want to the number that is in the description. So if you are driving, you can do that later. But I want to invite you to give in one of two ways. Normally, some of you give when you come to the room. Obviously, we can't do that today. And so I want to invite you to move your giving to an online format and you can even automate it so you don't even have to think about it that God has already stirred your heart and you're going to give in that way but it allows us to respond to need powerfully and effectively and immediately yeah so right now let's practice some generosity go ahead and pull out your phone I'm gonna get my phone out right now go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead pull out your laptop and go to activechurches.com or text the number that's going to come up on the screen right now and you'll be set up to give as you text that number I just did done perfect easy <laughs> Hey, in the next moment, we're about to head into some worship. Yeah. And this may be different, this may be unique for you, but I wanna invite you to engage with us in this act of worship. Pastor James and the crew have been preparing for this moment, and we wanna invite you to sing loud. There may be people that you're with right now, invite them to sing with you today. Yeah. Nobody's gonna put any pressure on you, but this is just a moment for us and you, and us as a church family in many locations to sing together. So how about do this, uh, stand up, Give somebody a high five and let's get into worship right now. And can I just say one more time, thank you for joining us online and welcome home.
the highest king would welcome you. I was lost, but he brought me into his love for me. For his love for me. Who the sun sets free, who oh, is free
what an incredible time of worship we just had. Can we just give a big round of applause for Pastor James and the crew, wherever you're at? I love that regardless if we're scattered or gathered, we are still the church and we're still singing these anthems of hope. Hey, I have some church news for you. I want to give you an update. Easter is coming, and I want to invite you to come join me at 8 o'clock, 9.30, and 11. We're going to be gathering together and celebrating the resurrection of Jesus and the story he's been telling here at Active and the story he's been telling in so many different lives. And we as a church get to be a part of this in such a significant way. I want to invite you to share our posts, to share our graphics, and to share the stories that are going to be coming out soon about Easter Sunday at Active Church. Also, I want to invite you, if you haven't yet, join us. Being generous right now is such a season where we can provide some significant hope. And as Pastor Mike said earlier, it's an awesome way through the local church for us to provide immediate needs and felt needs. And so I want to invite you to be a part of the story that we are writing here at Active Church as we are providing hope in a very significant way in our city now. So again, you can do that by going online to activechurches.com and clicking that give button or by texting the number that is on the screen and texting the amount to that number and it'll be setting you up to give from here on out. Hey, Active Church, we're going into another week of our series you have permission. If you haven't heard this series before, if you haven't caught up, go check out our podcast. But we're heading into another week of You Have Permission, and it's all about living confidently. And I want you to live confidently, but before Pastor Mike gets on and preaches, we join me in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for these moments that we have as a church, as a community. Whether we're scattered or whether we're gathered, we are still your body. God, may you move in our hearts and may you show us what we need to hear today. We lift this up in your son's holy name, and all God's people said, amen. It's Pastor Mike, and I'm so honored to be able to be in your home or in your space today. Often we'll invite you to Active Church Ukaipa, Active Church Redlands, and today I'm honored that you've invited me into your space. And as Pastor Joe mentioned, we're in this series called You Have Permission, and we're talking about how to live confidently. And what we're going to wrestle with today is really important. We're going to wrestle with this statement, that you have permission to wonder why. Why is a question that all of us ask. Why is a question that I think is deep within our bones. We want to know why. We want to know why things are happening. We want to know how things work. I think all of us are a bit inquisitive. My youngest daughter is really inquisitive. Her, her name is Riley. She's 11. The other day, we were snuggling in bed before she went to sleep, and she asked a really thoughtful question. She said, Daddy, when we get to heaven, will we know that we're in heaven? And of course, I'm a sucker for that because I'm a Christian, right? And I'm a pastor. And so, yeah, of course, I'm going to answer that question. And we talked for 20 minutes, and it was beautiful. We talked about Jesus, we talked about the cross, we talked about the resurrection, we talked about love. And I was so grateful for that conversation. And then at the end of the conversation, I said, baby, it's time to go to sleep. And so she said, okay, daddy, and gave me a kiss, and I walked out. And I realized that even though it was a really thoughtful question, I also think it was very manipulative of her, because I think she wanted to extend her bedtime, and I got duped. And I'm glad I got duped, because we had this really special moment. She also asked really silly questions. Like the other day, we were in quarantine, like maybe you are right now. And she ran out from her bedroom. She said, Daddy, what color? Blue, yellow, or red? And I was caught off guard. I was working on something. And I went, uh, blue. And she goes, all right, I think I'm going to go with red. And she ran back into the room. But Riley is very inquisitive. She wants to know things. She wants to know how things work. She wants to know why people behave the way that they behave. She wants to know facts and figures. And she's thoughtful sometimes, and she's silly sometimes. She likes to ask why. She likes to wonder why. And I think all of us fit in that category. And why really falls into two places. There's the why questions that are informational. Again, facts and figures. And then there are the why questions that are more emotional. And I think a lot of us are really curious about the emotional side of things. I think a lot of us are really wondering why and it's questions that are deep within our heart, deep within our soul. We're wondering why we were spoken to that way or why we were treated in that way. 
or why these circumstances are the way that they are. Why, on the emotional side, represents some things that are stirring in us. And we ask those questions because we think that it's going to help us to move forward. Sometimes we say, well, I just, I just want to know. I think that this will help me to be able to process why this took place in my life. A few years ago, I was meeting with a mentor, a friend of mine. His name's Tom. And we were sitting across the table at a Red Lobster, and he paid. I was grateful for that. And we were sitting across the table from each other, and I was sharing with him some of the why questions I had. And they were very personal and very emotional. And he said something to me that, that rocked me. It wrecked me in that moment. He said, Mike, you have permission to ask why. You have permission to wonder why. But could I push back on you for a moment? I said, sure. And he said, what sort of answers are you looking for? And I said, what do you mean? And he said, I would expect that you asking why, you wondering why, I would expect that you're looking for some answers. But do you think that those answers are emotionally satisfying? And I paused for a moment and went, I don't know. His point was, often when we ask why, when I ask why, I want answers, and I want answers now. But he was helping me to understand that even if I got the best answer in the world, it wouldn't satisfy my soul. Like, maybe for you, you're asking why that person passed, why you had to do life without them now. And if you wanted to know why, and you asked why, you have permission to ask that question. But the reality is, is the answer, I don't think, will be emotionally satisfying for you. There isn't an answer that's going to make you go, oh, that's why it happened. Okay, I'm good, right? And that's why I think that this question is important for us to ask, but it's also important for us to really process why we're asking it. And I think that there's a better question to ask. And my friend Tom gave me this question. He said, Mike, I want you to consider something. Instead of asking why, what if you asked what now? Like in light of what's going on in your life, in light of these circumstances, instead of asking why because the answer isn't going to be emotionally satisfying, what if instead you said, well, what do I do now? Now, I know it's easy to talk about and much harder to participate in. And I don't know your circumstances. I don't know what your why question is. And so I don't want to assume. I don't want to pretend. I don't want to act like I understand that. But I do think that there is a better question to ask, and it's the question, what now? What do we do now? How do we handle this? How do we face this? I would ask you that right now. Like, how would you handle this circumstance or this situation or that loss? What would you do now? This is why I love the scriptures, actually, because the scriptures are filled with men and women who had to navigate things long before we had to. And they did it with such grace and such wisdom. And lucky for us, it was recorded and it was shared. And today I want to share with you a story of a woman named Rizpah. She's not well known at all in the scriptures. In fact, she shows up twice. One time she shows up in a list of names. Another time she shows up in a really kind of dark and tragic moment. But in this dark and tragic moment, there's this moment where she makes a decision. Instead of being stuck in her why, she decides to ask the question, what now? And it brings hope and it changes her world. And honestly, it changes the entire world. And so today we're going to be in the document called 2 Samuel chapter 21 in the scriptures. And if you have a Bible with you or if you have the Bible app on your phone or a smart device, I would invite you to turn to 2 Samuel chapter 21 and we will spend some time starting in verse 10. And as you're turning there, can I just set the story up for you? Rizpah was a concubine and it was a really respectful way to describe a woman who was not married in that time, but had children from the man that she was in relationship with. The one that she knew, the one that she was in relationship with, was the first king of Israel. His name was Saul. Saul was an interesting character, man. A lot of theologians believe that Saul was struggling with mental health issues because of his behavior and because of what we can read about him. Some would say that he was bipolar. Some would say that he was manic-depressed. Some would say that he just needed a whole lot of help. And Saul was not a confident man. He was always wondering about the circumstances around him. And there was this moment in his story where he makes this covenant, this promise with a group of people called the Gibeonites. And this promise was that they would protect each other. And halfway through this promise, Saul violated it. And he ended up killing a few of these people that he had made a commitment to. 
A few years later, after Saul had died, King David takes over the throne. David is the David that fought Goliath, if you're familiar with that story. David is the David that is a man after God's own heart, as described in the scriptures. David is the David that's a part of the story of Jesus and the family tree of Jesus. David is trying to resolve the tension of the kingdom at the time. And so he approaches the Gibeonites and he says, hey, what can we do to bring peace? What can we do to solve this? And they said, well, we're not going to ask for anybody's life. We're not going to do what Saul did to us. And David said, listen, I understand that this is painful, but I want you to consider what we can do so that we're not at tension with each other anymore. And then someone speaks up and says, David, here's what we could do. You could give us all seven of the sons of Saul. We're going to take their life and we're going to hang them from a tree. Now, immediately that feels very violent. It feels very aggressive, right? And you would think that David, being a man after God's own heart, would say, no, we can't do that. We're not going to do eye for an eye, right? One Jewish theologian said, eye for an eye leaves the whole world blind. But David agrees. And he agrees to hand over these seven sons of Saul. Two of them were Rizpah's sons. And they killed them. And they hung them on top of a mountain for everybody to see. And that's where we pick up the story of Rizpah. And it's powerful in her response. If you have a Bible with you or if you're following along, 2 Samuel 21, starting in verse 10, it says, Rizpah took sackcloth and spread it out for herself on a rock. From the beginning of the harvest till the rain poured down from the heavens on the bodies, she did not let the birds of the air touch them by day or the wild animals by night. Rizpah does this thing that Jewish culture describes as a sitting shiva. It's a moment where you just sit in the grief and you sit in the pain and you sit in the emotion. This woman lost her kids. Her boys were murdered and she didn't cause it. And neither did they. It was caused by someone that she dated. She was a concubine for her. And he had long been passed. And now she's suffering the consequences of it. And so she lays out sackcloth. She lays out a, 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 a blanket, really, and just sits and protects her two boys and the other five boys, the sons of Saul, the cousins of her boys. And she protects them from the birds of the air and from the animals of the land. Remember, they're dead. They've been killed and they're hanging there. And this mom decides to pull a sitting shiva, to sit there and just be in the emotion and in the grief and in the pain of that moment. And it's a terrible moment. It's a heartbreaking moment. But her protection is powerful because... Maybe she felt guilty about her sons having their lives taken from them and she didn't do more to protect them. Maybe she feels like this is the only thing that she can do as a mom. My friend Lee said to me just recently as we were facing this quarantine and news of the coronavirus, it's caused things to be flipped upside down. And a lot of us don't know what to do. And he had this line. He said, Michael, when you don't know what to do, do what you know. And that's what Rizpah did. She's a mom. And so she started to mom so hard in that moment. And it seems so foreign and so weird for us a thousand years after it happened, right? And yet this mom needed to be with her kids and protect them. The writer tells us, Samuel wrote this, the writer tells us that from the fall until the spring, she protected these boys. She protected them from the birds and from the animals. And then in verse 11 of 2 Samuel 21, we read that when David was told about what Rizpah was doing, he went and took the bones of these boys and he got them down. And then verse 13, it says, David brought the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan from there and the bones that, of these boys that had been killed and he buried them appropriately. He did everything that was necessary to honor the story of these young men. And then it moves on. It begins to talk about wars and talks about David's household and the things that he was doing. 
The story is kind of depressing, right? It's a tragedy. And the question is like, so, so what's the point? The ending's actually the point. Instead of Rizpah being stuck in her why, she decided to ask the question, what now? And what she did right now was protect these bodies of these boys, two of them being her boys. She decided to do something that could help her to move forward, to tell a better story, right? Knowing that there isn't going to be a satisfying answer into why this happened, she decided to choose to do something better. Rizpah decided to do what love requires of her. She chose to care. She chose to protect. She chose courage. I think in moments where we don't know what to do, we just do what we know. Recently, I had a friend come to me and he didn't say any words to me. He just gave me a chip. It was a red chip. And he gave me a hug. And he said, God, it's so good to me. And through tears, he backed away and said, thank you, Mike. And he walked away. The chip was a one-month sobriety chip. And then three months later, he came to me. And he gave me a hug with tears. And he said, God has been so good to me. And he gave me a second chip. And it was a three-month sobriety chip. Recently, he sent me a message on Instagram. And he said, hey, when we're out of quarantine, I've got my six-month chip for you. See, my friend could have been stuck and asked the question, why? Why is this happening to me? But instead, he asked, what do I do now? Now that I'm struggling with this addiction, what do I do now? And each month, he's given me his chip to say, hey, a better story is possible because I'm not going to get stuck in my why. Rispa does what love requires of her, and it changes everything. I don't know if you noticed, but the end of this story is powerful. After David gets the bodies of these young men and he gives them an appropriate burial, we read at the end of verse 14, these words. After that, God answered prayer on behalf of the land. See, this moment of David making this deal with the Gibeonites and handing over the boys, having them killed, it wasn't what God wanted, obviously. And it wasn't the best way forward. It was an eye for an eye. But this woman decided to, instead of asking, why are you taking my boys? She said, what am I going to do now? And her actions moved the heart of the king. And he took action and buried appropriately, gave them an appropriate burial. And God then responded in that moment, answering the prayers of the land. Rizpah's actions changed everything for them. It moved the heart of the king and, listen, moved the heart of God. So what does this mean for us, right? As we have permission to wonder why, we have permission to ask why. What does it mean for us? I want to invite you to ask a better question. And it's not just the question of what do I do now? But I want to ask you to ask yourself a better question. It's the question that Rizpah had to answer. What does love require of me? What does it require of me in this moment of pain, in this moment of sorrow, in this moment of suffering? What does love require of me? And I'm not talking about your love, like your fickle love and my fickle love, how I love tacos and I love my wife and I love God, right? We use the word to describe all of that. What I'm talking about is the love that has been shown by God through the person and work of Jesus. The love that John, who knew Jesus really well, said, Behold the manner of love that God has lavished upon us, that we, you and I, should be called sons and daughters of God. It's 1 John 3.1. It's an incredible thought. It's a love that changes lives. It's a love that gives us a new identity. Listen, in this time of quarantine, in this time of uncertainty, in this time of fear, you can ask why. You can wonder why. You have permission to do that. But I would push on you and I would ask you to consider something better. Consider what do you do now? Consider how do you act now? Consider this question. What does love require of you? What does love require of you now that you're home? Maybe out of work. What does love require of you now that your kids are not in school? What does love require of you now that you know that your neighbors may not be able to go out for a few weeks? What does love require of you? Listen, Active, we have an incredible opportunity in this season to do an incredible work. And I want to invite you to ask the question, what does love require of me? And I think there's three layers to it. The first layer is very personal. 
Maybe you need to begin to display in a very public way the personal work of God. And I know Easter's coming, and we're not sure if we're going to be meeting on campus or if we're going to be meeting off campus, if we're going to be meeting online or at a location, but that doesn't mean that life change has to stop. And so I want to invite you to consider what it would look like for you to get baptized. Listen, I will come over to your house. I'll stay at a socially acceptable distance and we'll have somebody who lives in your house baptize you and we'll pray over you and it'll be incredible. Listen, life change can happen wherever we're at. A better story can happen in your home, in your pool, in your bathtub, right? I want to invite you to consider getting baptized. And if you're thinking about that, leave us a comment or send us a direct message and I'll personally reach out to you because I'd love to talk to you about that. On a very public platform, in a very public way, what does love require of you? Is it time for you to send a text message, to make the phone call, to FaceTime those friends? Listen, just because we're in isolation doesn't mean that we have to be isolated. And I want to invite you to be more intentional about your relationships than ever before. More intentional about the relationships of those in your home and more intentional with those outside of your home. Reach out to them write a letter, make the call, active. I think that this is an opportunity for us to change our worlds because you and I can tell better stories. Listen, you have permission to wonder why, but I think a better question is, what do we do now in light of this circumstance? And friends, that leads us to the most important question. What does love require of you? What does love require of me? Let me pray for you. So God, I'm thankful for these stories, these obscure characters in the true word of God. I'm thankful for Rizpah and how she didn't get stuck in asking why and wondering why. She decided to do something better. She decided to tell a better story, to ask, what does love require of me? And people may have mocked her and they may have thought it was silly and Dumb to be able to sit by these boys who have already passed, who are already dead. And yet she knew that this was the best thing that she could do in that moment. And God, it stirred the heart of the king and it stirred your heart. You began to answer the prayers of the nations because the king did the right thing in response to what Rizpah did. So God, may we not get stuck in our why, not get stuck in our questions of why, because there's not going to be an emotionally satisfying answer. But may we live in a better story. May we answer this question, what does love require of me? And we can ask this question because you've sent Jesus and you've loved us and love us because of Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray all these things. Amen and amen and amen. We wrote this song before anyone really knew about this pandemic, but it's so appropriate now for the current climate of things. And it's a song about trusting God through something that's uncertain, through difficulty. And there is this honest component about anxiety and fear in the line that says, when every breath feels like a fight that you are with me and I hope that that translates to you and whoever's watching this when every moment feels like a fight when there's fear when there's doubt that God is with us though the waves push in you call me on the water and through the rushing wind I still can hear your voice when the earth gives way have a firm foundation far beyond the pain far above the noise I know I'm not fighting on my own there's nothing I can face I face alone but you are with me for every step for every climb when every breath feels like a fight in brightest day and darkest night you are with me and when i fall you are the hand 
for me to hold so I can stand No enemy could stand a chance You are with me You are with me There is amazing grace when I can't find my way home Through my joy and pain I sing how great you are There is a cornerstone where my hope needs an anchor Yeah, and I know your love will never be too far Cause you are with me for every step, for every climb when every breath is like a fight In brightest day and darkest night You are with me And when I fall you are the hand For me to hold so I can stand No enemy can stand a chance You are with me I know you're near No heights or depths I could go You will find me here And I'll sing an anthem of hope For you are with me For every step, for every climb When every breath is like a fire In brightest day and darkest night You are with me And when I fall you are the hands for me to hold so I can stand No enemy can stand a chance Cause you are with me You are with me Oh, you are with me What a day it has been for our community. Hey, great message, Mike. Any yep. final words, any final thoughts before you leave us today? Yeah, I just wanna remind you that you have permission to wonder why, but I think a better question to ask ourselves in moments where we're wondering why is to ask, hey, what now? What do we do now? And so the question I left you with at the end of the message is, what does love require of me? What does love require of you? Remember, just because we're in quarantine, doesn't mean that we don't get to love each other, right. right? And doesn't mean that we don't get to love those around us. And we actually have a challenge for you this week. Joe, would you tell them about that? Yeah, we wanna help you stay active at home. You heard it right. Over the next seven days, we're gonna be posting a graphic in the next few minutes that helps you stay active at home by connecting with loved ones, by writing letters, by staying connected uh, uh, to the thing that's most important. That's the people around you. And so our team has created this thing and we wanna invite you to take this challenge over the next seven days, grab some of the people you love, share the post and let people know that you're staying active by choosing to choose community. So we want to invite you to do this and let us know you're doing this by tagging us on Instagram and Facebook, but also in the comments, let us know how this message maybe shaped you, challenged you, or inspired you to live differently or think differently about life. Absolutely. And just a reminder, we could not do this without you. That's right. And so we want to invite you to practice generosity. You can do that in one of two ways. You can go to activechurches.com, click the giving link to get started, or you can text the amount that you would like to give to the number on the screen. And remember, all of that helps other people to tell a better story and it helps you personally to tell a better story as well. Yeah. Hey, and before we leave today, we want to let you know we love you. Thank you for tuning in. Very much. We'll see you next Sunday. Active Church at Home.